Los Angeles. Two goats scavenging for food on the back lot of a Hollywood soon, uh, studio. They're munching away on a film uh, that they found, an old reel of film. One goat turns to the other and says, hey, this isn't, uh, isn't bad at all, is it? And the other goat says, well, it's okay, but the book was better. <laughs> We're going to cancel two weeks. <laughs> now, I've been, I've been your pastor for a year now, and I've been preaching here since January of last year, and you've kind of gotten to know me, and you know that I like films. I'm kind of a movie buff. Um, I like all kinds of films. I like westerns. I like zombie movies, sci-fi. I like uh, anything that has explosions and monsters. Uh, that's just me. I can. I even like uh, some of the chick flicks. You know, I like to sit there with my wife and uh, watch her cry when we watch something that's a tearjerker. You know, I enjoy that. Um, if it's a blockbuster movie, I can't wait to see it. And after I've seen it, I know there's going to be a sequel. You know, there always is. Uh, I love sequels. Remember Toy Story? I love Toy Story. My wife doesn't like cartoons. I drug her to the movie. I said, we got to go see this. It was a wonderful movie. Toy Story 2, the sequel, was even better. I, if you haven't seen it, you've got to. Be better plot, more characters. And then there was The Godfather. Uh, I loved The Godfather. I mean, how do you top Marlon Brando? And then they came out with Godfather 2. It was even better. Al Pacino, Diane uh, Keaton. Keaton, Robert Duvall, one of my favorite actors. A great movie uh, telling the story of the Corleone family and uh, the, the best acting you'll ever want to see in a movie. Uh, who can forget Star Trek, the movie by Paramount Studios. I could not wait for that to premiere. I was there for the uh, opening of that movie. Uh, I think I went to Livonia. I can't remember the theater. I dropped my kids there. They loved it. was a great movie. Well, it was an okay movie. I still loved it. I, I mean, uh, Captain Kirk is, it'll always be William Shatner. I don't care who they bring out. William Shatner is Captain Kirk. And I knew that they would make a sequel, The Wrath of Khan. Oh. Now there was a movie. I mean, that is a classic. You've got to see it. Uh, Khan takes over a ship. Remember the, the, the movie? And uh, he has in possession this scientific discovery that uh, has massive destructive capabilities. And it's up to Kirk and his old crew to save the universe. What an exciting movie. It required a sacrifice. Who can forget that poignant scene? Spock says to Kirk, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. I can see it just bringing chills up and down your spine. Eh? <laughs> Nothing like a sequel. Love them. This morning, I'm going to introduce you to another sequel. When you read the book of Judges, you are reading the sequel of the book of Joshua. And you won't be disappointed. I mean, if you like Joshua, the sequel is even better. Academy Award winning stuff here. And this book transports us back in time, immediately following the death of Joshua and the birth of Samuel, when judges ruled. No president, no kings. No governors, no senate, no congress. Hey, I kind of like that. <laughs> Government was small. And justice was quick and life was really exciting back then. In this book you can read of the exploits of the men and the women who led the nation of Israel and saved their people from outside oppression. There was a problem. In Judges 
chapter 21 and verse 35, it reads, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Mm. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone had his or her own opinion on how things should be uh, run, what was right, what was wrong. Can you imagine the turmoil uh, that this philosophy can bring to a nation? But, but again, this was before kings and rulers and legislative bodies and, and all the other trappings of government. So when Israel was threatened by an outside enemy, a, a great army about to invade, uh, they would pray and they would ask God to help them and pick out a man who would lead them uh, in victory. Judges chapter 2 verse 18 tells it this way. Whenever the Lord placed a judge over Israel, he was with that judge and rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime. And this brings us now to our focus this morning. I call it Lessons from Gideon. There came a day when the nation of Israel uh, was in another messy situation. People were doing what they wanted to do, you know, it was kind of crazy. The philosophy was probably, if it feels good, do it. Few people went to church. The nation was really in a backslidden state. There were only a few that acknowledged God. And God had every right to just leave them to their own devices. Apparently someone was praying. Someone was praying for Israel. And when a person prays, remember last week's message, God answers prayer. And this time their prayers were answered through a fellow by the name of Gideon. And it's in Gideon this morning that we find three lessons for living the Christian life and for knowing victory. Let's begin. Point number one is called Recruited. Chapter 6 of Judges. We're introduced to our hero in this sequel to the book of Joshua. Gideon is a farmer. He's just trying to eke out a living. I mean, he's a small farmer. It's, uh, it's not a, a big farm. It's not very impressive. On this particular day, uh, our, our young man, our, our hero, is busy doing his chores. He's threshing the wheat. That's what farmers do. They thresh the wheat. Now, this is normally a, a pretty easy job. Um, but this is Israel. This is the time... Of judges and the Midianites um, were the latest problem you see this great Midianite army is about to invade Israel they have a mighty army um, they've been very successful oppressing people and it was uh, their custom, if they needed something, uh, low on supplies, uh, you know, need a little extra money in the coffers, they just go in and invade and take what they want and leave. And they've been doing this to Israel. So Gideon, who is a farmer, and normally this job of threshing is out in the open in a field, he knows that the Midianites could swoop in at any moment and take all his wheat. And so we find him doing his farm chores out of sight in a wine press. And it's down in this wine press that he's visited by an angel. Judges chapter 6 verse 11. It says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the oak tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, as the clan of Abiezer, Gideon, son of Joash, had been threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain 
from the Midianites. We've got to stop right here. Have you ever wondered if God has a sense of humor? <clears throat> oh, he does. He really does. He loves a good joke. He loves to laugh. That's why I like humor in my messages, because I know God is appreciating these jokes even when you're not. <laughs> That's true faith. <laughs> In verse 12, listen to this, verse 12, I'm going to get you. <laughs> and verse 12, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Gideon, and said to him, now listen to this, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. <laughs> this is Gideon, the farmer. He's down in this deep pit called a wine press. He's scared to death. The Midianites are going to swoop in. He's afraid and he's doing his chores. And the angel appears and says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Another translation reads, uh, God is with you, O mighty warrior. <laughs> mighty hero? A mighty warrior? Hardly. I mean, the last thing in the world that Gideon looked like was a mighty warrior. He replies, you better talk back when an angel says something to you. And he says, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Why are we being attacked by Midianites? Why are they taking our goods? I mean, we're oppressed. We're not happy. I'm scared to death. I'm down in this pit. I'm a farmer. I'm not a soldier. Well, Gideon gets an answer. In verse 16, the Lord said to him, and he's speaking to him through this angel, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. That's our first lesson for Christian living. Our first lesson from Gideon. God wants to use us. He, he can do great and mighty things through us, with us, even in spite of us. God works through men and women, ordinary folk, like you and me. If we'll let him. Husband and wife. They're spending uh, the afternoon at a, at a shopping mall. As they're walking down the mall corridor, they stop at one of those scales. You, you put your coin in and it gives you your weight and your fortune. And so the husband steps on the scale, drops his coin in, out pops a little card. He reads it and says, hey honey, listen to this. It says, I'm handsome, energetic, bright, resourceful, and I'm a great husband. <laughs> Yeah, and it got your weight wrong, too. <laughs> if you're the type of person who struts around convinced that uh, you're the answer to every problem, then God probably can't use you. He can do more with one willing Christian who may lack some of the talents and some of the abilities of others. He can do more with that person than he can with someone who struts around with their chest out and their ego is just flaunted. And God is looking for the willing soul. I imagine we've got some Gideons in our congregation. Some of them are here. Some of them we may see next week or next month. We've got some Gideons. Chances are God wants to use you. When I was pastoring in Ohio, I had a fellow in our congregation, his name was Ron. I won't give you his last name. Uh, he was the owner of a local hardware store. He loved the retail business. He was just a nice guy, a gentle soul. Uh, married three kids. Uh, attended church, great supporter of the church, very timid. 
and quiet. And if you asked him to read scripture in a service or sing in the choir or, or do something outside for the church, he was always scared to death and he would always find an excuse uh, not to volunteer. He was just that type of personality. I could not get him in the pulpit to read anything. And then we had a special service. I had a speaker preached a good message and, and Ron got gloriously saved. He was a good man, he just wasn't a Christian. And something happened to him. <laughs> I was getting ready for a vacation. I said, Ron, I said, I can't find anyone to fill the pulpit for me. I really think you could do this. And I, I almost fainted when he said, sure, I'll do it. And when I got back the next week, the congregation was telling me what a great job he did. First time ever, public speaking. I'll tell you, it's amazing what God can do with someone who is willing, who loves him, and who is willing to work for him. <laughs> Ron was my Gideon in the church. I remember I told him, and Ron, you have a promise in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We can. Let's go on. Point number two. I call this redeployed. Now, before Gideon can take care of the mission, fight for the Lord, he needs to do one thing. In verse 25 of chapter 6, That night, the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second best bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, Pull down your father's altar to Baal. That's idol worshiping, Baal. Cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Now, you're wondering, okay, what's this to me? I think this is teaching us that before you can say yes to God's call, before you can say yes to God, you got to make certain that there's nothing that stands in the way, nothing that is between you and Jesus. And let's face it, some of us, we have idols. We do. Oh, we don't think about them as idols, but they are because we put them before God. Anything placed in front of God, anything that you might consider more important than serving God is an idol. And Gideon, Gideon is teaching us you got to tear it down. Now, in, in, in our story of Gideon, with the idols torn down, this scared little farmer gathers up an army of men, camps out near the Midianites, gets ready for battle. He thinks he's ready. <laughs> God isn't finished with him. God looks at his army. He's not happy. <clears throat> Picture the scene. Here's Gideon. He's got 32,000 men ready to go into battle. And he's probably thinking, I have got a pretty good sized army here. I think I can whip these guys. And God already, already promised that he was going to help me. So 32,000 and God on my side? We're going to win this. <laughs> And that's when God comes to him and orders a redeployment. In chapter 7, verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, You have too many warriors. If you let all, if if I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave and go home. <coughs> 22,000 <laughs> stood up and said, I am history. <laughs> Here's Gideon now, he's left with 10,000. All right, 10,000. I, I, maybe we can still do this with 10,000. Uh, hmm. Verse 4, God speaks to Gideon again. Still too many. 
bring them down to the spring, and I will sort out who will go and who will not. And this was the test. Uh, the 10,000 would go to the stream and drink water. Um, if they drank water like a dog, you now lapping it up, they'd be sent home. If they drank the water with their hands and were vigilant, they could stay. Gideon, after that test, <coughs> has 300 in his army. <laughs> Can you imagine that? He went from 32,000 <coughs> to 300. I'm sure Gideon is saying, oh my, what have I got myself into? I've got to check out the enemy and find out what kind of resources they have before I go into battle. And so he um, goes on a spy mission sneaks down to the Midian camp and he overhears a guard speaking to another guard. They're having a conversation. Verse 13. I had this dream and in my dream a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, knocked it flat. Then the next verse, his friend says, your dream can mean only one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over all the armies united with Midian. Now, can you imagine, Gideon has heard this. What a source of encouragement. I mean, at that moment he realized that God was going to bring him the victory. And so he goes back, he gets his army of 300, they creep to the edge of the camp, and in verse 20 it says, that the 300 men broke their jars, they held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands, and they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. 300 screaming soldiers in the night with torches running down on this huge camp, this huge army, thousands upon thousands of Midianites, and the Midianites, they look out into the darkness, they see the torches, they think there must be thousands of them. Somehow they get confused, they're fighting against each other. And when the smoke clears, Midian has been defeated. <laughs> Gideon's army of 300 has whooped them. Trust in the Lord, and he can bring you the victory. And that brings us to point number three. I call this remember. Now we have this story of Gideon and his army. Two important lessons. Lesson number one. When you feel inadequate, when you're battling with an inferiority complex, and you think, God can't use me. And maybe you've even said no to God, or you're tempted to say no. Remember Gideon. Remember who called you? Called Gideon, a lowly farmer. If God has called you, you can do all things through Christ who will give you the strength. True story. Um, and you know, I pastored eight years in the Methodist Church and I heard the story of um, one of our ministers, Dr. Paul Quinlan. He was the pastor of First United Methodist Church in Houston, Texas. He pastored this church for 15 years uh, when he arrived, they had an attendance or a congregation of 2,500. When he left, 15 years later, it was bulging at over 6,000. An amazing fellow, a marvelous story. Um, this is how he started out in ministry. He lived in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. He worked in a pot bottle plant, a bottling plant. And one day the pastor had the nerve to go to the plant and visit uh, uh, visit uh, Dr. Quillen. And uh, the pastor asked him, Paul, how old are you? And he answered, well, Pastor, I'm 30 years old. And then the pastor replied, when you finally stand before God, what will you tell him you did on earth? Make red soda pop? Well, he was a little indignant. He said, what's wrong with red soda pop? 
And the pastor said to him, nothing, except you happen to be blessed with great talents and abilities, and it should be used for God and for his glory. That spoke to him. God used a pastor to speak to a layman. It was kind of like that visit that Gideon had with an angel. And so he went back to school. He prepared for ministry. He was called to the first church in Houston. And he became one of the Methodist church's greatest leaders. From bottling pop to preaching the gospel. Many times in our daily challenges, we will come to a place where it seems like it's overwhelming. And even the little things will remind us of how inadequate we feel. The smallest task that the church may seem, may ask us to do, may seem like climbing Mount Everest. But when God challenges us to serve Him, we can do it. Lesson number two. Remember who promised to be with you. Jesus gave us these words of assurance. He said, Lo, I am with you always. God's still in the recruiting business. He's calling the Gideons of the church to go into battle. He's raising up a mighty army. It really is an onward Christian soldiers fight that we're in. So if you want to be a blessing and you want to be blessed, say yes to God. Amen.